Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Dorr. I am the International Studies Association's Director of Professional Development. Welcome to the third event in our academic career series. Today, we have Tina Huey, PhD, um, who is here to discuss crafting a teaching philosophy statement. Tina is the Associate Director in Faculty Development at the Center for Excellence, Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the University of Connecticut. Um, so today, Tina is going to go through some um, content that she has prepared for you. And then the last 15 minutes, we will reserve uh, for questions. In the meantime, if you have uh, any questions, you can certainly put them in the Q&A and we have chat enabled as well. So over to you, Tina. Thanks very much, Sarah. And thank you for inviting me to uh, come and join you today. I can't see anybody because we are in webinar mode. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, different for me to just be talking at my screen. Uh, but uh, I certainly look forward to hearing your voices and maybe seeing your comments in the chat once in a while when I get an opportunity to go back into the chat. Uh, normally, this session is a, a very interactive session, but again, because we're in, in webinar mode and we have such a, a wonderfully large group today, we're not going to do a whole lot of uh, interactive uh, activities, so you won't be in breakouts or anything like that. That being said, uh, I do have some writing prompts for you, so I hope that you will take a moment to gather some writing tools and materials. So whether that's in digital form or paper and pen, please take a moment to do that. And then also I would encourage you, uh, after I give you some time to write on these prompts, to raise your hand. Uh, and I, if you can, in this modality, uh, unmute. I'm not sure Sarah will need to help me with that and share a little bit about what, what you've written. That would be delightful. So again, as Sarah said, my name is Tina Huey. I use she, her pronouns. I work at the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning in Faculty Development, which also includes a lot of work with staff and graduate students who teach. So anybody who teaches engages with our CEDL here. We do a lot of workshops. We do consultations one-on-one. -on -one, we do class observations, which are entirely formative. Um, so you know, not intended to evaluate you so much as find points of growth and opportunity. I'm also an adjunct writing instructor. Uh, that is a job that I've held for many years over in the English department. And I teach first year students primarily. It's first year writing, but I also have a lot of sophomores and uh, juniors in my classes. So that's something I enjoy. And this workshop on crafting a teaching philosophy statement is one that I enjoy a lot, um, pro probably because it is grounded in my writing background. Proposed objectives for today's session are to discuss the desirable elements of a teaching philosophy statement and to begin drafting in response to some prompts I will provide you. And that includes some prompts for just getting started. Or if you already have a draft or an outline, maybe some prompts that will help you elaborate or unpack some things that you're uh, writing. And then some tips for considering your audience, your readers. In other words, Usually it's this committee that is evaluating your job application or a promotion tenure and review committee. And then there will be chance, as uh, Sarah said, to, um, to share what's on your mind. Sorry, I was just checking the chat there. Okay. All right, so we'll begin with uh, writing for an audience because this type of writing is usually not something we do just on our own. We're doing it um, with a specific audience in mind. Although I do recommend that you uh, write for yourself to unpack um, and elaborate on some of your beliefs and values and assumptions. Uh, but let's start here with the fact that we are writing for an audience. So basic writing advice says that when you begin writing, try to ignore these chattering voices that may be looking over your shoulder, right? So we all have teachers in the past who have made uh, assertions about our writing or our ability to write. Um, maybe we don't think of ourselves as writers. Maybe in your discipline, that's that's um, a very common uh, part of what you do. So you know, you, you probably do think of yourselves as writers. Um, but what, whoever it be that's sort of telling you there's one way to do this and you should be nervous about this, try to ignore that to the extent possible because writing a teaching philosophy statement is an opportunity for you really to just kind of touch base with yourself, right? And just 
have an opportunity to think about things we normally don't really stop or pause to think about um, and try to identify specific things that we do and why we do them. So we wanna give ourselves time to reflect on what we do and why we do it. This is, what are our experiences? Who are, what are our influences? And so if you've never taught a class before, you still have experiences in education. You probably have been influenced by the teachers and professors that you've had. So even if you've never taught, you can certainly reach back into your own educational experience and think about what worked for you as a student. What made you feel like you were learning? What made you feel like you were connected to the goals and objectives of a class? What made you feel like you connected to an instructor? So giving yourself this time is essential. Uh, it, it's not something that really comes up quickly is unpacking our assumptions about what education should be, what it should look like, who should be in it, who should be in a discipline, who doesn't belong, right? Um, so it takes time to unpack our assumptions. Uh, and then often we forget all the cool things we've done. So identifying our practices is another thing that benefits from some time that we give to this writing process. We want to reflect and draft first and then revise for a specific audience, right? So even though you are prompted to write a teaching philosophy statement because you're applying for a job or for a promotion and or tenure review, you know, you know you have this audience that's going to be reading this at some point. Try to put that away when you begin and, and simply reflect on teaching or your educational experiences, things you've observed or things you've done. Uh, and then draft, we always call that free writing. So free writing technically means that you just put your pen to the paper and you not, don't lift it for a certain amount of time. You set your timer on the phone, 20 minutes is common, but you can do it for five minutes. Um, or, you know, of course, if you're typing into a screen, just set your timer for an amount of time and then try not to stop typing or writing whatever comes up into your mind, just write it. Even if it is your grocery list or what you're going to have for dinner, right? Um, or things you need to remember to do. Allow yourself to get that out there. Um, but the key in free writing is not to stop writing. Um, you do wanna read the job ad or the institutional promotion tenure and review guidelines. So I'll mention that up front. I will return to this. And if you're applying for a job to learn about the department and institution that you're applying to. So one way to start this process, if you are stumped, is to look at the syllab a syllabus that you have created or a syllabus that you have been a TA for, a course that you've been a TA for. You can reflect on the way you've interacted with students, both formally and informally. Um, and then what connects your teaching to the broader context? Here, you're starting with you, what you already have as someone in a particular subject area or discipline who's probably attended conferences or been part of seminars, right? Um, so you know a little bit about the discipline that is a broader context for your teaching, assuming you're going into teach in the same discipline that you are, are currently studying or working in. And then, Think about how your teaching currently is shaped by the institution that you're at. So not assuming that teaching is going to be generic across all institutions, it's not. And we can get into that later, but when you're applying for a job, let's say at a community college, you are going to have different classrooms, a different uh, student body and different uh, you know, institutional contexts, different institutional supports, different priorities that the institution has. Uh, compared to some other kinds of institutions. So think about the teaching you've already done or the learning you've already done as shaped by the institution you where you were. Um, and think about, that will help you think about how things could be different perhaps in another context. So we know from hiring committees that they have some concrete questions they want answered from your job portfolio, including your teaching philosophy statement. And here are the ones that come up most often. What will this candidate add to our department? What will our students gain from this candidate's classes? And what will our department gain in terms of specific courses, new opportunities for students to develop their skills and knowledge, and interesting pedagogical approaches? So you can see here that 
uh, departments have perhaps a little bit of a checklist or some things that they need to check off their list. You can imagine what some of these things might be. It might be, we need somebody to teach the introductory courses, or we need someone to teach the upper level courses in this particular subject, or we need someone who has a methodology that no one in our department currently masters. Uh, so the interesting pedagogical approach is, I don't want anyone to think that that means you have to be an expert in teaching and learning, because let's be honest, uh, most of the time, we're not really trained in that when we are going for um, the kinds of jobs that require a teaching philosophy statement, at least in higher education, right? There is a downplaying of teaching, uh, and at the very least, there's not a whole lot of explicit instruction that we get uh, when we are um, either graduate students or junior faculty or tenured faculty for that matter, right? And certainly if we are adjunct faculty, there's very little training opportunities uh, uh, available, uh, generally speaking. So these interesting pedagogical approaches, it does, don't, don't let that scare you. That is not intended to say, oh, your teaching philosophy statement has to mention all of the different learning taxonomies, right? Not at all. Uh, but if you do know a little bit about those things, then a teaching philosophy statement is a good place to, to uh, use those frameworks to help you explain what you do and what you're like in the classroom. Right? Um, so putting all that aside, the audience, the pedagogies, these kinds of things, really what a teaching philosophy statement should begin with is engagement. So it's an opportunity for you to show that you are engaged in what you're doing as a teacher, as an instructor, right? So we have, often we have a research statement that we write, uh, but the teaching philosophy statement is for teaching. Uh, and it's an opportunity for, for you to show your level of engagement. And here are some, some suggestions for you that I'd, I'd like you to go ahead and take a, uh, about three minutes to write for yourself on. Um, one of my goals for this session is that you have some, you walk away with something, um, even if it's just a couple of paragraphs that may lead you to unfold and unpack even more for, for further writing. So I'd like you to think about what excites you about your academic area. Okay, so, so these are just some sentence stems that I invite you to complete. Uh, what excites me about my academic area is, uh, what matters about my academic area is, and I would prefer to teach blank courses because and then complete that, that sentence stem. So I'm going to set my timer for three minutes and then um, we'll move on. But please do take these three minutes to, to, to complete at least one of these sentence stems. Okay, so you can put a, an end to the current sentence that you're working on. I will try to put these prompts into the chat. Thank you so much for the reminder. Uh, so I'm just curious if anybody would like to raise their hand and unmute. Sarah can unmute you if you raise your hand. I'm having a problem with this. Okay, um, I liked the first sentence. It got me thinking. I said that what I excites me about uh, my academic area, which is uh, political science and studies, is that it resonates with what happens in the news. Um, every time I look at the, I read the news or I listen to the news, I, I can make connections with uh, what I have learned or what I know um, as an expert in this area. So it's, it's, an, it's always something each day that gets me to think about. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. Did, does that translate into how you would teach? Oh, yes. Uh, I always use uh, what I call a real life event to help students understand a concept, especially if I'm teaching a theoretical course um, and it's perhaps a complex theory or people are not getting the theory, um, I will get them, I will use an, an event for them to, to approach it uh, or to at least grasp, and understand. Um, if it's to do with political conflict, what is political conflict, for instance? Uh, how does it express itself? I can use the Ukrainian war and it's just right there in the news. And I can even just open up a video from YouTube or for one of the uh, media houses and we can just look 
each of us see something smaller and episode and then we can have a discussion about it. Martha, why is it important for students to understand their world? I'm not sure if you heard my question, but I was trying to sort of uh, model this unpacking, right? So yes, a specific example yes. of what you did. And now, so, so why would that be important for students to understand the world around them? Uh, for me, it's important for them to understand that around them because they are participants in making history. Uh, they are participants in, they are not only just helps them understand, it also helps them participate, uh, uh, formulate opinions, uh, and also find solutions or find, uh, make a contribution, find how they can make a contribution and how does it matter to me in my everyday life. Now for the Ukraine war, um, it has impacted us globally. And, and so it is in their interest to understand what is happening and make connections mm -hmm. with, for instance, the global inflation, uh, the mm -hmm worries about recession, the impact on Europe. So it's not a war there in another country. It's also coming to affect me here at a very local level. Mm -hmm. So you think it's part of your responsibility as a teacher or instructor to uh, help students make a contribution in the world? Yes, <laughs> that's what's meaningful for me because that's yeah. what yeah. academic work is my second career. Previous mm -hmm. career was in nonprofit, international peace building and all. And I was very much doing, uh, uh, working with community to solve problems and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and to engage with the question of power. <laughs> and, Wonderful. Yeah, all of that so can go into a, a statement. I, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, so, so, uh, so just to point out that, you know, the commitments that, that one instructor has may not be a commitment that another instructor has. So it may sound obvious to, to oneself that yeah. of course we yeah. want we want to help students contribute to the world and connect them to their agency and make them active participants. Yeah. But that's not obvious for all instructors. There are other instructors who feel that universities should be kind of a, a secluded space where students can explore a lot of ideas without having to necessarily contend with the, the wider world. Yeah. Yeah, and that's been my challenge in terms of, uh, I'm excited, I, I, that's my value in, in terms of what education is for, but there's also to, there's students who just want to reflect and not feel under pressure. Because I, as a teacher, I feel I'm in a position of authority, students look up to me and they might feel under pressure. That's what I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I totally, totally hear that from my own teaching as well. Um, so, uh, Sarah, are there any comments in the chat that you want to bring forward or anybody else has their hand raised? Uh, we have a message in the chat from Patricia. Um, can, do you see that in your chat? Yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be um, worth sharing that with the group mm -hmm. because the group can't see it if, if there's time for that. Oh, okay, great. So Patricia writes that uh, an education in the field, in her field, must entail not only a theoretical, but also a practical dimension. So a connection to career. So Patricia, right, you know, you might think about what is it you do in the classroom to connect students to potential careers in the field? Uh, how do you explain that purpose um, and how your subject, you know, your assignments how do your assignments connect to what they're going to be doing in the future? Do you design do you design your assignments and exams and papers and whatnot to reflect the kind of work that they'll be doing in, in the practical level in their careers? I, and Patricia continues to write, what matters about my academic area is to rely on problem solving exercises about current, again, that current international issues that Bertha mentioned, uh, mobilizing theories, offering solutions as professionals, um, great. I would prefer to teach introductory courses because it is relevant to incorporate the teaching and learning of professional competencies from day one. Yes. Okay. So that's a reflection on how you see first year students. You see the whole trajectory of someone at university, that there's an opportunity there in the first year to, um, to maybe establish habits or whatever. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, to, so that students can feel as practitioners, right? So they can start to develop. Sometimes we hear that in my field of teaching and learning as, can students start to develop an identity? 
as a practitioner, as a nonprofit leader, as a scientist, as a writer? Uh, absolutely. How can we help students begin to feel uh, part of that identity? Okay, uh, wonderful. Um, other hands raised, Sarah? Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I, you encouraged us to kind of be fluid and not too self judgmental. So I wrote some things down. Okay, you great. Know, I got to teach um, greenhouse technology at UConn this past semester from January to May or whatever. So um, I was a greenhouse grower for 22, 22 years. So I'm kind of attempting to give back. I'm somebody who performed this work for a long time. Greenhouse is a growth area in agriculture. And in Connecticut, it's a big chunk of the pie in agriculture. And uh, so, and then if you ask me what I would prefer to teach, it would be greenhouse management or plant propagation, which are my two specialties. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been challenged by my committees in the past on student engagement and also uh, diversity and inclusion is a big part of any new dialogue. When I taught in California for four years, all my students were Hispanic for the most part. Uh, so um, I, I got immersed in uh, cross-culturalism. There were also uh, Iranian, Persian-speaking uh, students as well. Well, thank you, John, for those that the wonderfully concrete examples that you gave and the explanation about why uh, what excites you about this field. It's a growth area, um, no pun intended. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, what came to mind as I was hearing you speak is, and also the diversity and inclusion piece, which is a separate workshop we're going to do next week, but we'll touch on it later. Um, but it does remind me of something Sue Min put into the Q&A is what should we look for when we are trying to learn about the department we're applying to or the institution we're applying to. And I think there, you know, you really want to make sure that you're not talking about courses that they are not equipped to, to have you teach. So for whatever reason, they might have not have greenhouse technology, but they really would like someone to teach some fundamental science courses, right, um, in, in your, in your uh, department. So that's kind of what I mean by look at any cues that you can find in the job ad. So um, often, they will often they'll be generic, right? You'll get like a job ad that just says, write a teaching philosophy statement, and then they don't give you any more information. But sometimes you, they will elaborate a little bit, right? Where they will tell you a little bit about what it is they're looking for in a teaching philosophy statement. And that's what I mean by try to learn about, um, about that, look carefully at the job ad. And then learning about the department and institution may involve going to their websites and of course, we have to keep in mind that websites are a public relations uh, artifact, and so they're not necessarily going to tell you with a lot of detail what it's really like at that institution. So that's where we recommend that you talk to people in uh, in conferences or talk to people in your uh, circle, professional circles, to see if they can connect you to someone at that institution that you could you could talk to. There are a lot of different ways that you can do that kind of research. Um, so. I hope that answers a little bit. Um, we have a question from Priya. Priya, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, Priya. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, like first and second question. First question is about the, I think uh, this is, that significance of the area which uh, somebody is or, or I'm teaching to, to their students. So how uh, that, uh, that uh, subject or course matter is important or significant, or that will be very much uh, relevant to the student for their own life or for the, for the world community. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question uh, comes when uh, you have a very, very uh, imaginary question from the student, like suppose if I am teaching something in a uh, conflict in South Asia or, or somewhere in, in that Middle East, then a very imaginary question comes that how will you uh, build a society uh, where uh, the peace is possible? But uh, the, there is lack of visionary leaders and, and uh, you don't have the people who can think beyond their day-to-day -day activities. 
so uh, in that uh, sense in that question uh, the entire uh, formulation of the the courses uh, actually becomes very much uh, questionable so uh, how how can uh, we deal with this kind of uh, situation or or issues where the question is is really uh, important and and they are uh, asking a very uh, tough question to the uh, to the instructor yes so i the way i interpret your question is uh, kind of to say well we we teach all these things in our classrooms and we explain to students what's what matters about this discipline or this subject and we in inspire them maybe to hope and dream that they can make change and then we send them out into the world where there are leaders who are not visionary and there are a lot of barriers to change is that interpreting your question pretty well yes 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 yeah of course that is the conditions of teaching right is that we are in some ways uh, <laughs> creating an idealistic kind of scenario in our classrooms um, with the expectation that um, students will uh, become change agents but that is something we also can control through our teaching to some extent or we can at least try some things like that would be my philosophy is to say well there are things i can do as an instructor to help uh, students develop strategies for making change in, in spite of whoever is in a leadership position in, in the wider world right so then i would create assignments or or maybe even have some experiential learning right where students have to go out and work with a nonprofit or work, work with a business to um to to do something in the real world so to speak um but how i design my assignments and and, and assessments now changes because i believe that it is important to prepare students to be change agents or to pre or prepare them to meet resistance from leadership that's another thing right is you might build an assignment that says the competency that you need from my class is how do you manage up how do you, like i'm just i'm just brainstorming with you here priya because this is your area of expertise um, but that's kind of what I would say. I don't know if anybody else would want to chime in, or maybe we could see if there are other questions, or maybe people are ready to move on. What do you think, Sarah? So I think we are ready to move on. I don't see any other questions or comments in the chat. Okay, if anybody wants to follow up on, on what Priya was saying, um, we can definitely have time for that in the Q&A. Um, okay, so uh, the next prompt that I have for you, it, it involves this set of images and in a moment i'm going to put a link in the chat that will take you to a Google Doc where you can see these images better if you need to see them better. Uh, because they're they're kind of small here, but the invitation here is to write yourself a five minute essay. <laughs> the form doesn't matter, uh, but just write for five minutes, which of these images says something about your teaching and it may be that none of them does but. Uh, maybe you do find one that says something about your teaching and elaborate on that for about five minutes choose one image and try to explain to yourself why you chose it when you think about your teaching right so if we just put this into the chat if you'll bear with me okay so this one's always fun, especially when we have um, <laughs> an opportunity to uh, see one another or be in breakout sessions. Um, but I think that uh, we do have some time, Sarah, if, if you'd find it useful for, for anybody who wishes to share what this exercise was like for them or which image they chose and why. So if you'd like to do that, go ahead and raise your hand and Sarah will unmute you. Okay, so we have one attendee that raised their hand. And I'm curious if anybody chose the image I chose. Let's see. So Lisa has her hand up. Hey, okay, Lisa, you should be able to, to speak now. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. I chose the image of the, the ship. Mm -hmm. um, it really drew me in, quite frankly. One of the classes that I teach is upper level international political economy. And one of the things that I always want the students to come away with is a sense that things that happen at the international level 
impact their own everyday lives and their own everyday lives are part of the international economy. So I try to think of inventive forms of experiential learning. And one of the things that I do is assign a kind of a, a mini ethnography of students' closets, asking them to categorize certain articles of clothing by type and country of origin. And so when I look at the ship, I think about the fact that a simple t-shirt that we wear, um, it might start in a cotton field in Texas, but it actually ends up being manufactured in a factory in Bangladesh. And so when I do that and I tease out conversations after that kind of, of basic foundational mini ethnography work is done, then the conversations lead all of us in the class to appreciate complexities of, of the global circuits that they are part of. Um, you know, how different people live in distinct geographical contexts, it, you know, the gender the division of labor, um, economic aspects of globalization and global trade and, you know, perceptions of poverty and that kind of thing. So for me, that ship was like, boom, right in the center of my mind. And I just thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing both your experience with this exercise and uh, the concrete thing you do in your classroom. And that reminded me of what we talk about here often at the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. There's so much evidence now that uh, we need to connect what we're teaching to what students already know. That that's how we make learning stick. So the exercise that you're doing may be an illustration of that teaching philosophy statement or that pedagogical awareness that we can't just pour theories into our students' minds, but that they might learn better or they do learn better according to the literature if we connect what they're learning to something they already know. In this case, they're closets, right? Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Sarah, do you want to call on someone else? Um, we have Jerome. Jerome has his hand raised. Um, Jerome, you should be able to speak now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, I just put in the chat that the tool resonated with me. I, I believe those are needle nose pliers. And um, I'm still sort of new to teaching. I did some graduate uh, teaching as a graduate assistant uh, many years ago. Um, but in my classroom, I aim to provide students with the necessary tools to help them navigate their academic, personal, and professional development. And um, I really well, that image resonated with me because um, I couldn't see it that well, but it looked like with the needle nose pliers, um, maybe they were fashioning um, some of the metal pieces into different things. Um, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for that. There are other instructors who don't see themselves as providing tools so much as telling students what to think. Right. So um, in some clinical settings, you can imagine an instructor, for example, in a school of nursing, really needing to tell students how to do something right, rather than giving them a, a range of tools from which they can choose as the situation um, requires it. Um, I'm generalizing here, but but I'm trying to unpack what you said, which, um, which which resonated from that picture. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So Tina, we have a comment in the chat from Christopher Williams on the movie. He focused on the movie. Okay, you're like literally the first person who's ever chosen that one. Yay. Let's hear it. Um, it he doesn't have his hand raised, but okay. he knows that movies are like stories. I often use stories to spark interest and make theoretical concepts more concrete by grounding them in specific historical examples. Very good, great, great. So now we get a picture of what you're like in the classroom and what kinds of activities you have students do. Fantastic. Um, anybody else? I think there's some other hands. Bertha had her hand up, has her hand up. So Bertha, can you, are you able to say something? Can we hear you? Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to say um, like Jerome, 
I chose the one with the pliers and the, um, the needles and rings. The, I found that I was drawn to that and I was surprised. And I uh, later wondered, wondered, what is this about? And then I realized it's about crafting. I'm a crafter too. Yeah. You know, that, so that was resonated immediately. Mm. With, and, um, and, and I just hadn't made a connection to my teaching until now. Yeah. And it's Jerome who helped me make the connection. Mm. He said, he sees it as tools. He said, That's what I usually tell my students that uh, what uh, they're learning is to see it as tools. Um, and, and, and I like to, my assignments in some of my courses, especially the theory and practice courses, I teach in peace studies too. And so there's a practice element. There's a course I taught on project evaluation and wanted students to understand that theory has a, has a use. So I assigned a, 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 an evaluation, a theory-based evaluation um, to, to elicit a, a practice theory. So they looked at uh, stories of uh, successful interventions, peace building intervention. Mm -hmm. I read them, I gave them uh, uh, several stories, and then I asked them based on that, those descriptions of cases to uh, try and elicit, you know, work through, get out. So the theory was a tool uh, for them to begin uh, having a first cut at, and the method just getting, um, uncovering, or just getting out or making explicit the, 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 the theory, the practice. Well, also, if you're, if you're using a case study method, it sounds like you are applying, they are applying the theory. Yes, so I was trying to make connections. Uh, I found it very interesting. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, yeah. No, that's of really why helpful. I'm drawn to it. And then what, how to yeah. make sense of it and apply it to my own, because I'm a craft. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Jerome so, so you are insisting that they apply the theories, right? You're not just yes. going to lecture on theories. So that's a that's part of your philosophy. Um, yes. The other thing you mentioned that I wanted to highlight for everyone is how you describe you describe yourself as a crafter. Um, we don't have to say what our other interests are in our teaching philosophy statement, but just to be aware that we bring ourselves into the classroom. We're not okay. just a separate identity, right? And so this teaching philosophy statement writing process can sometimes help us uncover the things that we do that are really grounded in who, what we like to do and who we are. And that that means we can also start thinking about how that might impact inclusion and equity in our classrooms, yeah. right? So we, we make that connection that we are also have an identity, a background, and potentially we can then talk about biases and things like that, yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on if that's okay with everybody. Uh, and then we have a little time for Q and A at the end. So uh, I wanted to offer some prompts for you and let me just check on our time right now. I think we won't have time to write on this right now, but uh, I'm happy to share my slides with everybody after I'll share them with Sarah and she can share them with you. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, something I found very powerful myself when I started to think about my teaching philosophy, and this goes back a little bit to what um, I think it was John who was saying uh, about being very content focused right, which can be a strength for sure. Um, but we do teach subjects, right? And then I want to offer to you that we also teach students. So going back to how we teach subjects, some questions we can ask ourselves are, what motivates me to learn about my, this subject, right? And then how would I translate that into activities and assignments and assessments that align with my sense of motivation? Or I survey my students to find out what motivates them so I can align everything with that and reach them, okay? Another question would be, what do you expect to be the outcomes of your teaching? How do you know when you've taught successfully? Another good one is, how does your research influence your teaching? Are you the kind of person who includes your undergraduates, for example, in the whole research inquiry process and gives them a glimpse into that world? And then the last question here is thinking back on your own education, what was a moment when you knew you had learned a subject successfully? Then you can perhaps some, do some free writing in, you know, when you have some time about how you, how you think about students and how their identities play a role in your teaching. And back to this thing, it really begins with, with ourselves, right? Back to this thing that, that um, Bertha was sharing, how does our own identity and background affect our teaching and learning? Um, how does your students' identities and background affect teaching and learning in your classes? How do you know when you've taught successfully? How does your research influence your teaching? 
same questions as before, but now thinking of it through the lens of the student. What is your approach to evaluating and assessing students and why? Uh, how do you utilize multiple pedagogical approaches in your teaching? So we're keeping in mind that we are teaching students. Like, so we often say, I teach writing, I teach international relations. No, we're really teaching students, right? Um, so the two things have to coexist. Um, so we can talk more about that if you'd like in the Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna talk at you for a little bit now for the next few minutes, uh, a little bit of a lecture here, uh, but to share some guidelines for what constitutes a good statement. This is borrowed from University of Michigan. It offers evidence of practice. A good statement offers evidence and all of you who have unmuted and put things in the chat have offered evidence of things that you do, practical things you do. It also conveys reflectiveness. Why do I do what I do? Where does that come from, right? And what are the, what do I hope will be the impact in the future or in another realm? It communicates that engagement, that teaching is valued, right? So your enthusiasm, why your subject or discipline matters. It is student or learning centered. So it doesn't come across as you just telling everybody what a wonderful teacher you are, um, but explains why you think your wonderful teaching is going to have an impact on learning. And it is attuned to differences, differences in student abilities, background knowledge, or levels, just to take a few examples, right? So what you might do if we had a little more time is look at what you've written so far and identify where you're already doing some of these things. And then the next step would be, if you haven't done it already, is add a story or an example that demonstrates evidence of practice, reflectiveness, communicating that teaching is valued, learner focus, um, or attunement to differences. So there's some do, do's and don'ts when you're writing a statement. You don't wanna write dogmatic statements. You don't wanna write something like, uh, the lecture is completely out of date. I would never use a lecture in my class. You know, because for one thing, lectures can be useful, right? They often are. Often they're the only thing we can do if we have a 300 person class. So then the question is how can we make our lecture more interesting and or interactive? Uh, avoid jargon and technical terms in most cases. If you're applying to a school of education, you would probably need to put in some pedagogical jargon, right? That's what I'm getting at here. Um, but you don't want to assume that your committee is up to speed with all the latest technical terms or jargon, and you will run the risk of alienating them if you use too much of it. And don't repeat what's already on your resume. You can certainly draw from it and point to specific things you've done, but the teaching philosophy statement is a different animal, so to speak, than your resume. What you do want to do is read the job announcement carefully. You want to state what you actually believe in and practice. Uh, you want to ask someone in your field to guide you on discipline specific issues. Again, I'm sitting here at a central office, very uh, sort of broad based. I cannot have the insight that you will require for your discipline specific issues. Use metaphors to paint a picture of what you're like in the classroom and what students can expect. And if you are not asked to write a separate diversity statement, that is more and more common is to uh, write a separate diversity statement. Uh, you do definitely want to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion in your teaching philosophy statement. Now, uh, most of the people in this room will probably, you know, do a lot of writing, so I'll go quickly through this, but um, guidelines for writing, you want to choose the format that works best for you in this situation. Um, use present tense and first person, right? Uh, just use I, right? Um, I do this, <laughs> you know. Uh, remember, it's a writing sample, so you're going to want to edit it and proofread it. Write with a specific audience in mind. So have some a bunch of writing that you've generated, but then when you go to prepare to send it to somebody, you want to tailor it to some extent. Support your statements with evidence and examples. Don't be afraid to show your personality and make it memorable and unique. It you know, doesn't have to be generic. And then keep it to one or maybe two pages. Um, I'm offering a simple structure for, for writers who are uh, unsure about how to structure their whole statement. And so that will be in the slides that I'll share. So I will, I'll go quickly through it. But here are some key questions that others are going to ask when they're reviewing your teaching philosophy statement. Is it clear and lucid? 
Does the approach to teaching and learning demonstrate reflection and careful planning or flexibility when appropriate? And here we might mention how, if you taught during the COVID um, remote teaching uh, boom, I, <laughs> we're not post pandemic by any stretch. So I'm not going to say that uh, or imply that we are, but during the, the, the intense move to remote teaching, you know, what was your, what was your uh, practice around flexibility? and why. Uh, questions uh, others will ask in reviewing your statement, does it address fully the institutional context of teaching and learning? Or does it sound like you're coming from another planet, you know, where you, you're gonna do something that, you know, people typically don't do in your field and that's all you're going to do. Uh, does the statement show awareness of the conventions and expectations of the discipline? Uh, so for example, if you're in science, technology, engineering, and math, if you don't talk about the, world, the role of, labs, laboratories, then you're not really showing awareness of the conventions of, of engineering instruction or scientific instruction. And then readers will often be looking to see if, if this is a modest statement or, or a more ambitious statement. And that, I don't know what more to say about that, except to say that you need to be yourself. And if you're very ambitious about your teaching, show that. Show that if you want to try a whole lot of new things this is a good place to do it. I will include some more prompts uh, for free rights. So let me go through those. And then I'm certainly happy to share some samples, but I think we're kind of short on time. Um, and so I'd prefer to use the time for Q&A if that's okay with everybody. We do have some resources listed here. A lot of this is specific to UConn and I know not everybody here is at UConn. So, uh, just keep that in mind when you look at it. Uh, and we are available to UConn staff, faculty, and graduate students for consultation. So I want to thank you um, and then just turn it over to, to Sarah to, to guide our Q&A. So the first question is from Sue Min. And she is wondering about, well, I, I will read the question. That's. <laughs> While you were explaining the slide on from the hiring committee, um, you mentioned learning taxonomies. Um, could you provide some resources where we can learn about these learning taxonomies and frameworks? Sure. Yeah, I can share that with uh, with Sarah. Okay, and I'm I'm certainly happy to include that with the slides and 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 get those get those out to everybody. If you wanted to have a preview, the the uh, the oldest taxonomy in the in the room. I don't know if this is true, but one of the ones that's been around for a long time is Bloom's taxonomy. I'll put that in the chat, uh, so you can certainly Google that if I can find the chat. Yeah, but there's a, there have been a lot of iterations of, of Bloom's taxonomy from when it started. Bloom's taxonomy has to do with higher order versus lower order thinking skills. So we often will ask students in large classes to simply regurgitate or remember something we've lectured them at, on and they have to remember it on an exam. That's considered pretty lower order thinking versus like moving up that scale towards the very top of it, which is creating, asking students to create something. Let's say create a problem set or create a performance or create a video. Those are all higher, require higher order thinking skills. So that's what Bloom's taxonomy is about. Okay, so the next question is, what's the regular length of a teaching statement? The regular length is between one and two pages. But again, read the read the um, job announcement if if you can to see if they have specific desires. But one to two pages is typical. And Tina, I know we have um, a global audience here. Can the length of the document vary? by the, uh, the country of the institution, or is usually two pages pretty standard? Thank you so much for asking that. I always learn something in every workshop and I'm making a little note here um, to always say that what I'm, what I'm presenting is in, a, in the context of the United States and that I don't know what it would be like at other institutions. I'm sorry about that. So I am looking for other questions in the chat. I don't, oh, I see one more question that popped up. Um, this is a this is a good question. 
How can you demonstrate your passion for teaching without being weepy or sentimentalist? I, I, I get that, which I mean, I was just processing that, thinking that this is somebody who really does love teaching. Um, if you find yourself at that point, which I think is, is just a wonderful strength and resource as you go to write a statement. I mean, yeah, of course, you don't want to you don't want to um, overdo it in a statement, but I think the examples that you give, right? So you have lots of examples, you have varied examples. And then the other thing is, presumably you are attend, uh, attending workshops, presumably you are trying to develop yourself as a teacher. Maybe you're starting something in your group of colleagues. Uh, I, there are lots of graduate students here and faculty, of course, who create reading groups or learning communities or brown bag lunch seminars right, because they're lifelong learners and they realize they need to continue to learn about teaching. It's not something you ever finish learning about. So if you're doing anything like that, if you're doing something for your professional organizations to organize something, you know, that's something you could highlight and that would show your passion for teaching. Um, another question is, well, it's, can you tell us the structure of a teaching philosophy statement? I know this was on a slide, so so, so um, that will be sent around to everybody. Yeah, it's just a proposal. Uh, if you are wanting a basic place to start, completely uh, fine structure is to do intro, an introduction, a body two body paragraphs, or maybe three, and then a conclusion. And so the slides will have some uh, suggestions for what to put into each of those sections. But there's no one way. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. I my my students always dislike it when I say there's no one right answer. Right? But there are lots of different ways to do it. But that is a good structure. So, um, I yeah, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much, Tina. I am seeing a ton of positive feedback in the chat. I'm very glad that this was helpful for our audience. And me too. And thank you for letting me be here and for all the things that you have taught me today, all everyone here. So thank you. So we will we will see you next week, Tina. Looking forward to it. Have a nice uh -huh. weekend, everyone. Bye, everyone.